uh, my presentation um, today is about the appearing evolution in Africa. And um, I hope I'll be able to share with you what our experiences have been in trying to develop peering and interconnection in Africa. So, um, well, most of you, I believe, know what the Internet Society is. So I will sort of skip through this um, and go straight into the background of um, what's been happening in Africa uh, for the last several years. Now I'm going to go back to 2008, and the reason why I will specifically start at 2008 with a lot of the data is because that's the time I started working at the Internet Society, but also it's a time that we started actually keeping track of what's really going on with peering and interconnection in Africa. Um, well, first and foremost, Africa is big compared to the way you see it on the map. And um, sort of, I came across this image some time back, and I thought it was quite an interesting uh, representation of how the, con uh, the size of the continent. Um, in 2008, this is pretty much how uh, the continent looked like, and I can represent that in a map with respect to the status of internet exchange points and submarine uh, cable infrastructure connecting the region. Now, what this map will not be able to show you was that because the pricing of the submarine cable uh, capacity was so high, most of the countries that had access to these cables were largely dependent on satellite connectivity to, to have access to the rest of the world. That means for internet connectivity, uh, general telecommunications, that's voice, um, and any other uh, fax and all that. South Africa was pretty much the only country that had a lot of, uh, or rather used fiber connectivity, terrest submarine terrestrial connectivity to reach the rest of the world. The rest of them uh, depended largely on satellite. Now in 2008, we tried to reach out to the exchange points that we knew existed. There were 17 of them, and only 12 responded. And we tried to get some data out of them in terms of what's going on with the exchange point, um, how many members do they have, what is the policies that they have uh, with respect to membership joining. And we, we were able to collect some data which was quite interesting for us. Um, for instance, majority of the exchange points that responded had a mandatory multilateral peering policy. Um, and that was, we thought, that was quite interesting because we did not expect that quite that many would have such a, po a peering policy. Um, some had very high peering charges. Um, one exchange point charged as much as $9,000 a month to peer at the exchange point. Um, others we thought which were interesting was the fact that uh, the connectivity to the exchange point was quite averagely okay at the time because they had fiber and wireless links to the exchange point, but it was limited in terms of the speed. The overall capacity connecting the region, um, Africa, was one main cable really, which was uh, the SAT3 cable at 340 gigabits. Uh, the others was too small, SAT2 SAT was very small, and uh, Simiwi3, which was at the north, just connecting three countries, that is Djibouti, Egypt, Morocco um, at the time was, was also quite not well uh, uh, used at the time. We also tried to look at how much traffic was being exchanged across all those exchange points that responded, and the aggregate traffic we found was about 364 megabits per second. So, and the countries really that contributed more than 80% of, of the traffic then was Kenya, South Africa, and um, Egypt. So those were the three big exchanges at the time. So we found some interesting things from that study, uh, uh, that survey rather, um, which was first and foremost, there was good relationship between the, uh, the exchange point and the CCTLDs. They had some decent connectivity. Governments had been involved or were trying to get involved more positively. And um, the models were sort of ideal at the time and we do understand why the exchange points had a multilateral pairing policy, uh, mandatory multilateral pairing policy, because the incumbents were very strong at the time. And 
to force everybody joining the exchange point, including the, uh, the incumbent to peer, then having a mandatory multilateral peering policy was sort of the thinking as to how they could get the incumbents who are very dominant to actually peer with the others. So there, there were reasons as to why we thought the, mod, uh, the IXP models were ideal at the time. But on the other hand, um, the that peering policy was not ideal because then it stopped others from joining. Uh, some operators felt that it was, you know, it, it, it was too st stringent a policy for them to actually join the exchange point. Um, other exchange points had very interesting peering policies, like um, one, uh, one of them um, had a policy where th they stated that for you to join the exchange point, you needed to have a license or you need they needed to sit down and decide whether you can join the exchange point and peer. So it was like a closed club. So having a closed club within the exchange point meant that unlike here, and I have to say one of the things which I've been very impressed is to see the diversity of uh, the, the interested candidates for the board positions of France IX. It means France IX has been able to open itself up for you know, a broad, uh, outside the traditional um, members of the exchange point, meaning the, C the CDNs and the ISPs, to other the corporate se uh, sector or the enterprise business. In this particular case, during this time, uh, 2008, um, the ISPs were very resistant to uh, having non-traditional members join the internet exchange point. And that was, a def in, in my view, a very negative policy to have uh, with respect to growing the exchange point. Um, most of the exchange points didn't charge, so they really didn't have a business model for sustainability. And they had limited services, uh, the value-added services that they provided to their membership. So we identified some gaps as a result of that survey. Uh, one of them was that there was a lack of general knowledge on the best practices of running internet exchange points. Um, there was no platform where the exchange points could actually meet and share experiences on how to grow and develop their inter respective internet exchange points. Cross-border interconnection was a big issue. Um, it, it still remains to be a big issue to date. Another thing was that of the exchange points that responded, the 12 that responded, the remaining five, it was not clear to us why they did not respond. They got the emails, so the emails didn't bounce back, but why nobody responded was not clear, and we kept following up. Um, so to a certain extent, we assumed that those exchange points were actually there by name, but not in actual operations, so they were not actually operational. Um, or the person who was involved and whom we had as the contact person was no longer the person involved and didn't really care. So there could have been many things we could have assumed, but it was difficult to know without actually having a response. And also it was difficult for us to actually go on site and verify that this exchange point actually operates. Another thing from that set, and if you can look at the map, you will see Central Africa, North and West Africa were really gaping holes, if you will. Um, there was really nothing going on there. And so we needed to put a lot of effort in that space. And looking at the amount of capacity that existed internationally versus the amount of traffic that was being exchanged at the IXPs in aggregate, we felt that there was something we choose to define as an internet transit deficit, meaning there was more traffic being e imported from outside the continent than was being uh, generated within the region. So at the Internet Society, we came up with a program called the Internet Interconnection and Traffic Exchange. And it, we hope that this program will try and address the gaps that we identified and ho help fix some of those issues that uh, we found were negative from the survey that we conducted. So the scope really here was to just try and transform Africa to become not just a consumer of internet, but also an internet creator at par with the rest of the world. And we needed to come up with a strong program and this program had you know, specific goals and objective. And one, was that one of them was to try and re um, 
if I would put it in a simple way, try and reduce the information asymmetry between what we in Africa knew about the peering and interconnection business and ecosystem uh, against what the rest of the world knew about uh, how to you know, uh, interconnect with and, and develop peering. So we came up with a plan. The plan basically ended up being branded as the 8020 by 2020 because the vision here is to have 80% local and 20% international internet traffic in Africa by the year 2020. So it's a very ambitious goal. And we thought it was quite ambitious at the time. We even thought we should not put it out there as a vision or a mission. But somehow it's picked on. And we are pleased that the fact that a lot of the partners we work with, uh, including France IX, um, are looking at it from a serious point of view. Sometimes it's a lot more serious than we do at the Internet Society. But it's really something that the, the community in Africa has embraced and is trying to use uh, to advance peering and interconnection in the region. So we had a couple of activities. Uh, some, um, I could just highlight the five main ones. The IXP assistance, which looks at developing new exchange points and leveling or helping the ones that already exist to, to come up. Um, develop a community of practice, basically create a platform where exchange points and service providers can meet and exchange ideas about interconnection. Um, capacity building, of course, the technical and the operational best practices on how to build internet exchange points was critical. And also statistics and information. It was very difficult to get data the very first time in 2008. We need to find a way of improving on this. And also engage policymakers and um, the business, I'll say the key stakeholders um, in the industry so that some of the policies that exist could be revised so that we have a better environment. Um, a case in point, if you want to cross a border between two countries, in each country, especially in the East African region where we have a certain point, which is about 600 meters, you have to cross something called the no man's land. Now, crossing that no man's land, for you to put fiber across there, you need to talk to at least five government agencies in each country. So, that makes it quite difficult. Uh, because you deal with five in one country and five in another. It also means you have to have an operating license in both countries to just put fiber across the border. So the regulators need to be aware of this as a challenge uh, because there is money and time involved before you actually make the investment. And the same thing applies uh, to the other countries. So bringing all those stakeholders together was quite important. So the program started in 2008. Um, through that, we've tried to cover as many countries as we possibly could uh, with capacity building workshops. Um, we, also, um, we did quite a number of them on technical hands-on routing. Um, some of the things which we came across was the fact that even with the exchange point being in place, the routing is not very efficient, so we had traffic tromboning still for some networks, so that had to be sorted. Uh, not many operators or service providers had autonomous system numbers, ASNs, an IP address space from Afrinic. So we had to get them to apply for that and use it for peering. Um, we had to do the best practices workshops where the stakeholders come and have a better understanding of why peering is important. Um, we started in 2010 with the African Peering and Interconnection Forum, which is the equivalent of the European Peering Forum in Africa, so that's been going on for the last five, six years. The last event was this August in Maputo, very well attended, and that's growing. So as a result, we've been able to develop the peering community in Africa. Now we are focusing on making sure that we have more peering coordinators so that uh, we can advance peering to the next level. As a result of the work we've been able to do, which is uh, about 15 workshops, six AFP peering, uh, um, peering and interconnection meetings, quite a number of policy workshops. Um, we, the African Union came up with, um, with a project, it's called the African Internet Exchange System, or AXIS. And the AXIS project was aimed at um, focus, uh, or rather, 
doing capacity building initiatives in countries that did not have internet exchange points and are member states of the African Union. So it was about 30 countries. So we needed to do workshops covering 30 countries on to help them and uh, st start a process towards setting up an internet exchange point. So because of the work we had done uh, in IXP development in Africa, we bid for the work, which was certainly sort of going outside what the Internet Society does. We bid for a project, and we were awarded by the, inter uh, the, the African Union, and we started the work in 2012. So between 2012 and 2014, we had to cover the 30 or so Afri uh, African countries that needed to uh, did not have Internet exchange points. Um, at the end of it, we did uh, 50 f uh, 56 workshops, actually comes to about 60 workshops, slightly more than 60 workshops in two years. Um, most of the countries we went twice, meaning um, 28 of them. We went to 28 countries twice. The first time to do the best practices workshop. The second time to do the technical aspects. So we had a process where we would go in, do the best practices, get the stakeholders to sit, agree to set up an internet exchange point, set up a task force to follow up the process of setting up the internet exchange point. Once they were ready, we'll go back in, and for five days we'll do technical hands-on training for the engineers of the initial networks that will connect to the exchange point. And then we would go back at a later date to actually set up the internet exchange point. So that part took two years, 28 countries. France IX was absolutely amazing in this case. Why? Because as you saw earlier, West Africa and Central Africa were sort of the blank spaces, right? These are countries that largely speak French. In Africa, we don't have a lot of French experts who can actually talk IXP or BGP. So we came to France IX and Lyon IX um, and a lot of the Fr uh, France IX members to ask for assistance and they were very helpful. And as a result, we were able to actually do most of the workshops um, in the Francophone countries, which is where we really needed a lot of the workshops done, and also including other Anglophone countries. So in total, we were able to train over 1,200 people on IXP issues, um, 700 on best practices, 500 on technical aspects, we also had a second phase of that, which was to discuss regional interconnection, and that also covered about 350 uh, experts who participated. Now, the regional interconnection aimed at addressing some of those cross-border interconnection issues, um, coming up with a task force that would actually um, help remove those barriers or those policies that require that you have to talk to five government agencies in one country and another. So that's work that's ongoing. It's being supported by the African Union, and we hope to see that changing. Um, as a result of that work, we've had new eight new internet exchange points established after since to, uh, 2014 when we completed this work. And as I can see earlier, France mentioned they are continuing the work so, uh, uh, to support Senegal and Morocco. Uh, Morocco was not covered under the uh, AXIS project uh, for political reasons that Morocco is not part of the African Union member states. But as, a, as you can see, there's a lot of commitment to support them. Um, we've also been able to develop the competencies within the region who, uh, by this I mean we have resource persons we can go to who are French speaking to help us carry on the work. Um, we've also been able to develop more partnerships. Uh, before we started the AXIS project, France IX was someone we knew. We could exchange emails, but nothing more. Now the relationship has been advanced, and not just with France IX, but also members of France IX and partners of uh, France IX. So for me, that's a big win for an organization that's really focusing on development work uh, in a continent like Africa. Um, Another thing that we've been able to achieve with the AXIS project as an outcome is that um, s exchange points have now been awarded some financial assistance to help them grow and bootstrap their processes to become regional 
exchange points. What do we mean by regional? We had a process where we helped them understand that building a regional exchange point does not mean a political statement where the African Union co can go and say, we are going to build a regional IXP in East Africa and find a politically correct country where we'll build a facility and call it a regional IX. We were able to demonstrate to the African Union and the other organizations involved that a regional exchange point is a facility where networks from outside that particular country can actually come and interconnect. And this is an existing facility as opposed to going and finding a politically correct country and location and building infrastructure from the ground up. So this was accepted and so now there is funding going into exchange points as opposed to going to a bank to get a loan to the exchange points that are able to demonstrate that they can work towards becoming a large exchange point and they will get funding to help them grow. So this process is ongoing, a few countries have been selected and we hope to see that uh, being of help to them. So as a result of this work we've had 33 exchange points which comes to about a 17% growth since 2008. We've seen the traffic growing from 340 Mbps. Now we are in excess of 160 gigabits of traffic being exchanged aggregately across all exchange points in Africa. And we've seen, if you look at this map, this is our current map of exchange point locations in Africa, you will see that there are more exchange points in Central and West Africa. And as time goes by, we will get more. Uh, Tunisia didn't have an exchange point at that time. The political environment there has changed, so now they have an exchange point. And we hope to see Morocco, Senegal, Niger, and Mali coming up in, th in the few years, um, at least in, in the next two, three years. Um, is there anything happening on cross-border? Yes. Um, we started a measurements program. Uh, part of the work is to try and come up with measurement tools and act, uh, programs, um, or rather a measurement program and implement some tools. There is work ongoing to implement what we are calling the African route views measurements. Um, we are using PCH and other route views that exists in the exchange points and we are developing a tool that will actually look at the route collector information and process that data and give us some visuals as to what's really going on at the exchange points. So using ASNs and prefixes and then we are going to match that against the Atlas probes and, um, and anchors to be able to have a better view of how the interconnection is evolving, both at the national and the regional level. And just a, uh, a snapshot of this, this is currently work that's ongoing um, with a PhD student at the IMDA University in Madrid from Africa, a student from Africa, um, from Benin. And um, this is the fine, uh, one of the initial output uh, data that we are seeing. So this is from South Africa. Now the good thing about this project is we'll be able to get data going all the way back to 2005 when some of the initial route collectors were put up at these exchange points. So some of the older exchange points will have useful data that they can see on how their interconnection, both at national and regional, has been going on. So this is an example of South Africa where you can see uh, there's a lot of local prefixes from uh, ASNs, sorry, origin and all ASNs from South Africa and external to South Africa but from Africa are also equally dominant. So this one just shows that there's a lot of peering from African networks in South Africa, um, uh, from Afrinic networks or uh, Afrinic assigned networks um, where they, they are getting their resources from Afrinic and also from South Africa. Same thing for Kenya, uh, you see 20% from Afrinic region, networks from Afrinic region and local um, and also from Arin um, and other, uh, other regions. This is from Cairo. Um, you will see that a large percentage of them are from uh, Afrinic region. You will see that, uh, uh, sorry, from, uh, from um, Egypt, but you won't see regions from the Afrinic regions, in a sense from the Afrinic region, because um, of a policy that the exists at the Cairo Internet Exchange Point which says that you cannot peer external networks at this exchange point because it's a local exchange point. 
So using this study, uh, this, this measurement program, we are beginning to identify some of the policy issues that actually affect the growth of an internet exchange point. So on this exchange point, you will not see external networks from the African region because they are not allowed to peer there. Uh, you will see a couple of the APNIC, uh, RIPE and ARIN networks, but this is not really peering as in external networks. Um, these are um, value-added services like PCH collectors, etc., that have ARIN and um, ASAs. So, but external networks will not be visible at this uh, exchange point. Um, so that's another one in Mozambique. So basically our work so far has been as uh, successful as, as a result of strong partnership and collaboration. So I'd like to really take a moment to say thank you very much to France IX and France IX members um, for their support to all the work that we've been doing with respect to um, development of uh, peering and interconnection in Africa. And we hope that we can continue count on in counting on you uh, as we go forward with the work that we need to do towards the goal of 8020 by 2020. So um, I did want to mention quickly what the challenges are. Um, very quickly, um, some of them I've covered in uh, some of my points earlier. Terrestrial infrastructure is still a challenge. This needs um, to be, uh, you know, to improve. Um, some cost on terrestrial uh, um, interconnection has made it such that people prefer to buy capacity. Uh, I'll give an example. Lagos, Abuja is the capital city of Nigeria. At a certain point, it was cheaper to buy capacity from Lagos, Abuja, sorry, to London than from Abuja to Lagos. Same country, it's cheaper to buy capacity from Abuja, which is right in the middle of Nigeria, to London than it is from the center of the country to the border. So those are issues we need to really uh, you know, address. Again, that's a policy issue. It's also an investment issue. Uh, carrier neutral data centers, we don't have many of them. Where they are there, they are carrier specific. And them being carrier specific, we also get issue, um, we also come across uh, certain challenges that not the full feature spectrum uh, of services will be available at that particular data center. For instance, you go in and there is no uh, meet me room. So if there's no meet me room when you want to interconnect with others, you're told, well, you have to invest in your own ODF. Oh, I have to do that? Okay. So, you know, th those kind of things tend to happen um, when the market is not well mature um, in certain services or products. Uh, Cross-border interconnection, I've talked about that, so I'll skip that. Managing stakeholder uh, interest is another challenge. Through the AXIS project, governments were involved because we were dealing with the African Union. So now governments had a stake, we thi which we think is important because of addressing issues related to policy. But then, now there's a confusion here between uh, who is going to take lead leadership or there's a lack of clarity of who is going to take leadership in towards the process uh, or in the process of establishing the internet exchange point. And so everybody waits on the other. So it takes such a long time. Um, another thing is we've had competing projects. The World Bank has given money to African governments to deploy infrastructure, which includes exchange points. And the African Union comes in and says, we also to help want to help you build internet exchange points. But the World Bank has more money. The African Union doesn't have much more money. So we have two competing projects trying to do the same thing. That tends to stall the project. And as a result of there being money from World Bank or the African Union, people want to gold plate exchange points. So we are asked to develop a proposal for an exchange point costing $400,000. Now, if you've all seen uh, Remco's presentation on how to build a $1,000 exchange point, you'll understand why we think a gold plated exchange point is not a good thing. We have the operational issues of exchange points, the challenge between volunteerism and paid staff, at the startup phase, how do you get good volunteers to work on this um, versus having to hire full-time or part-time staff? This is an ongoing challenge. Um, at the initial starting, pace, uh, starting points for exchange points, 
to ha to agree or rather for internet service providers to agree to pay the IXP fees when there's very little traffic to be exchanged um, becomes a big challenge so there's always contention whether they should start paying so that the exchange point is sustainable and can do more stuff becomes a bit tricky uh, good governance again at the beginning um, there is a bit of interest when they see the amount of work it becomes very difficult to call, call members and have a full room at the annual general meeting the quarterly board meetings uh, that are supposed to happen don't happen so the governance starts going down and so you have one board meeting no annual general meeting so then you end up falling back on 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 some of those uh, constitutional and statutory obligations um so I, I know I have to end up quickly, so I sort of have just two more slides to talk through. Uh, one of them is on the CDN cache deployment. This is a very new challenge we are facing where the likes of Google, Akamai, and others have brought in uh, their caches, and now we are having to deal with where do we host the cache? How do we pay for the transit to populate the cache? and coming up with the right models an agreement on where the caches sh uh, will, will be hosted has become a challenge and something that sort of puts the members against each other because some see like when you put the cache at the largest operator you're entrenching dominance of the incumbent of the large or the largest operator uh, some end up missing out on benefiting from the cache so that's something we're having to deal with and finally, measurement information. This is something that we, we are really trying hard to work on and get more information coming through from the IXPs and ISPs to have a better understanding of what's really going on with respect to interconnection. So we're looking ahead and we'll continue working in those areas that I've talked about. Um, uh, the peering forum, assisting exchange points with the equipment and technical assistance and also measurements and keep working on the policy engagements to make sure that the regional organizations, policy makers, uh, keep working on revi reviewing these policies that um, make it difficult for peering to grow in our region. So Africa is open for peering. There's a lot going on and we'll definitely be happy to show you around. So come to our peering forum. Um, next year it's going to be in in Tanzania, uh, around about August, we're to confirm the dates and we'll uh, let you get to meet the community. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have time um, to spend and to, um, to get to uh, Michuki. Uh, we were only a few of us happy to help, and it was too much for uh, four guys. So if you have time to spend to uh, Africa, Talk to Michuki and provide your help. It was a very tough time for the past uh, two years, so they need help. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Michuki. Even if it was a bit long, it was very high content presentation, and thanks a lot for this very detailed feedback. It's very useful for the audience. I just would say keep on the good job, and uh, France will be happy to continue to support you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now I will talk about the new POPs we deployed uh, in Paris. Uh, as Frank said uh, this morning, uh, we activate... Uh, uh, so this is what the traditional edge looks like. You got a data center or you have a network POP, you got edge sites, and then you, know, you connect to your peers and transit providers. Fairly simple, we've been doing it for 20 years.